As you're seated, if you would, grab your Bible, turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, is where we'll start this morning. We'll move through a few passages, the beginning of Romans, but um, we're going to start in Romans chapter 1. If you're just joining with us this morning, welcome. As Quentin said, it's our big weekend. We want to, this morning we're going to preach. We're going to stay in our series that we're working through this, this, over this next six weeks or five weeks counting today. Uh, we are studying the idea of what it means to be equipped, equipped specifically in this six weeks for the spread of the gospel, how we are going to take the gospel to the nations and those who are around us and those who need it so desperately and need to hear it. And again, I'm not trying to teach you new skills or things that you can use when you go to share the gospel. Instead, what we're trying to do over these six weeks is to embed within you certain convictions about the spread of the gospel and about the need of the gospel, specifically today about the need for the gospel. You see, sin is a problem. Well, put more clearly, sin is the problem. Sin is the problem of the world today. Sin is the problem of the world yesterday and the day before that and the day before that and the day before that, all the way back to Adam and Eve and their choice that they made. Sin has been the problem. But here's the thing. When we talk about sin, most of the time we focus on the actions, right? The sin, we think about the behaviors that somebody exhibits to exhibit their sin. But the Bible does not focus on, it, it does, but the, the condition of sin, the condition that we have is not so much the actions that we take, it's where those actions stem from. And the Bible is crystal clear that the actions of sin in our life, the, uh, the hands of sin in our life stem out of corrupted internal hearts. That's where the problem is. It's not the actions are a problem, but the heart is more so. Because sin pours forth from a corrupt heart. It's what produces the action. It's the heart. And that is why we're going to look at Romans chapter 1 today to see why is sin the problem of the heart that is facing humanity. In Romans chapter 1, Paul is writing a letter to a church he has never been to. He's writing a letter to a people he wants to support him as he wants to go to Spain on a mission trip. And he needs their support. He wants the Roman church to be a launching pad for him to go to Spain. And so he's writing this, and many have called, this is Paul's probably most theological letter, the, the longest portion of theology. And would you guess that the first theological subject that he touches on in this letter is the problem of sin. Because listen, until you come to terms with the fact that sin is a problem in your life and in my life and in lost people's lives, and that is the problem in lost people's lives, the gospel will never be on the forefront of your heart and mind. It won't be. All you'll want to do is just help them change their behavior. But the gospel doesn't, is not intended to just change behavior. The gospel is intended to penetrate to the heart and change the heart of the person. Until we see sin as the primary problem that people have, the gospel will never be on the forefront of our tongues. So I want to show you why Paul starts with the problem of sin in the book of Romans. There's really four, really three reasons he's going to let. There's more than that, but that's the ones we're going to camp out on this morning. And there's a lot here, and we are not going to cover it all, and we're going to move pretty quickly. Because I want you to see kind of the, the full picture from Romans 1 to 3 of what Paul is doing and how he is introducing sin as the problem that we face. So first, we're going to start in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And here's, here's what I want you to grab, okay, in this section of verses. Is listen. Sin invites the wrath of God because sin is the rejection of God. When a person is consumed by sin, they are inviting, they're asking for the wrath of God, upon, whether they know it or not, they're asking for the wrath of God upon their lives because they are rejecting their creator. 
Read with me in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed, is displayed, is sent forth from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, watch this, they suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, and they as all people, are without excuse. Look at verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or even give thanks to him. Instead, they became futile or, or in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Listen, sin is not just a problem, it is the problem, because ultimately at its core, sin is the rejection of God. And when you reject God, you invite the wrath of God. In verse 18, he says, the wrath of God is revealed. It's coming. It's, it's even here to some extent. Why? Because people have rejected God. It says in verse 18, they suppress the truth. They ignore God, verse 19. They are without excuse in verse 20. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. They became fools. They Verse 23 may be the most pervasive statement about it, though, about this section. When he says, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and all of these other things. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. Do you remember the Ten Commandments? Remember what number one is? Anybody? Number one? Nobody? No other God besides me, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody remember what number two is? No images. And what does Paul say right here? They exchanged the glory of the immortal God. They left number one for number two. This exchange is a breaking of the law of God at its core, at, at, it, at its just the simplest level. They've broke the law of God. But worse than that, they have abandoned God. They didn't just, they didn't just slip. This is not just a, oh, I messed up. A lot of times when we think about sin, it's, oh, you've made a mistake. You've just messed up a little bit. No, sin is a rejection of God. It's taking his law and saying, I don't want any part of that. And in turn, I don't want any part of you. When you sin, you reject God. And the problem with that is when you reject the creator, you reject everything that he has designed for you. You have rejected everything that he has created and the way it's supposed to go. And you have invited the wrath of God upon your life. It, sin invites the wrath of the God because sin is a rejection of God. If you keep reading in these verses, though, you're going to see a second reality emerges in the next set of, and from verses 24 down to 32. And what you're going to see there is because we have invited the wrath of God by rejecting God, sin ultimately, this is number two, sin destroys and condemns us because God will hand us over to the full effect of our sin. Sin ultimately destroys us and condemns us because God will hand us over to the full effect of our sin. Look at verse 25. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. 
Amen. This exchange, we pointed to it just a minute ago in verse 23. He used the same phrase. They exchanged. They swapped out. They changed. They, they, made, this, this, they made a decision. And in that decision, they say, God, you are no longer here. You are no longer central. You are no longer of primary importance. You are no longer the creator of my life. You are no longer anything that you have designed yourself and set it up in this world for you to be in my life. You are out, and anything else, primarily me, is in. When you make that choice, that does not leave you neutral before God. That doesn't leave you just, oh, you know, maybe someday we'll get it right. It doesn't leave you in that situation. When you make that choice, when you exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the created rather than the creator, you are not neutral. You are condemned. John 3, the verses, everybody knows John 3, 16, but the verses following that are so incredibly important. It said Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world because the world was already condemned because the world had already made the choice to wander off into sin the intentional choice to leave the creator for the created and when that happens it destroys and it condemns us three times in these verses 24 26 and 28 there's this phrase that comes up it says in my translation it says God gave them up Another translation might say, God handed them over. That does not mean that God just lifted his hand off of people. There is an act, action of God here that says, okay, if that's what you want to do, he, it's almost as if he ushers you out the door. You know why I know that? Go back to Adam and Eve again. When they sinned, where did they not remain? Where did they get kicked out of? They left the garden. God handed them over. He forced them out of the place that he had created and designed for them to live and to dwell for eternity. And what did he do? He sent them out to bear the full effect of their sin. Out of the place that he had created and specially made and specifically placed them into. Yet when we sin, we don't just get neutral with God. We don't just exist in this other. We are condemned. We are pushed out. And not only that, what else did he do in the garden? When he pushed them out, he put an angel there to keep them from going back in. Now, there's multiple reasons for that we don't have time for. But there's, he put an angel there to keep them out because they were not allowed in that space anymore. They were condemned and they are handed over. Now, in these verses, I'm not going to read them all, but in these verses you see that God hands people over. And when he hands them over, he hands them over to every, every action that you look at in our world today and say, oh man, that is, that is sinful. That's bad. Why do you think people do that stuff? He handed them over to bear the full effect and the full weight of their sin. Listen, when you pick an idol, he'll let you have that idol. If you want to chase that, he'll let you chase it. He'll hand you over. Three times, God gave them up. You can see it around the world in which we live. People desperately chasing for something to make them whole because they have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Sadly, you can probably see it in your own life. If you can't now, then you, I know you could at one point. You exchange the truth about God for a lie and you've chased an idol and you've seen God let you go down that road. People living in sin, that's every day. 
That's every day their heart makes this exchange. Every day they wake up and they chase the idol over the creator. You can see every act of verse 28 through 31 in the hearts of this world. Look at verse 32. Because here in verse 32, you can see the full weight of the problem. Remember, they've rejected God. They've exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And God's handed them over. It says, even though they knew God early on, verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree, they had the law, they had the commandments, that those who practice such things deserve, watch this, deserve to die. We're not talking about just the activity, people. We're not talking about just the the sinful choices that we make. We're talking about the corrupted heart. When the heart is corrupt, you deserve to die. The wrath of God leads to your death. When you choose the idol over the creator, you deserve to die. He goes on in verse 32, it says, listen, some of them have gone so far as not only do they do those things, but they give approval to those who practice them, saying all the more that if this is okay, this is an, an acceptable way to live your life. That is God letting the full effect of our sin come to bear. But the most depressing part of this whole picture because we haven't even got to it yet. The worst part comes over in chapter 3, starting in verse 9. And that is this. Sin plagues us all because we all sin, and not one of us can fix our sinfulness. Sin plagues us all Because we all sin, and none of us, not any single one of us, can fix our sinfulness. Just listen as Paul writes in chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Everybody is under sin. And then he begins to quote, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one, listen, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole, watch this, the whole world may be accountable to God. But look at verse 20. Put your eyes on it. Look at verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Sin plagues us all because we're all sinners and not a single one of us can fix it. I mean, that's a pretty serious list from 9 to 20, all those behaviors. But you might look at that list and you might go back to chapter 1 and look at that list and say, man, well, pastor, that's not really me. Like, I don't really think my feet are swift to shed blood. Like that's not been the nature of my, yeah, I might have messed up a little bit here and there, but I really haven't gone down that particular road. I don't really think I'm that worthless. I don't really think my path is leading to ruin and misery for myself and those who are around me. You might come with the argument that, you know what, Pastor, I I feel like, as I look at my life, I feel like I'm a pretty decent human being. 
Like there are people out there who are far, far worse than I am. They are those people. They have shed those blood. They are all the things from chapter 1. This must be about them. I know it says all, but I'm sure there's some room to wiggle in there, and I'm sure that somebody else is worse, and like there's got to be a different path over here for those who are not as bad. The problem with that argument is somebody already tried it. And they tried it with Jesus. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. This young fellow comes up to Jesus and he says, Teacher, listen to this. He says, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? How do, let me put that another way. Teacher, how do I fix my sin problem? What do I need to do? What kind of activity can I do to fix the wrong inside of me? How do, I, how do I go about doing this? And Jesus, knowing what's going on with this guy, looks at him and he says, well, one, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who's good. But if you want eternal life, keep the commandments. And I think Jesus is just kind of setting them up here. He says, and the guys are like, well, which, which ones? And Jesus says, well, how about, let's, he rattles off a few, he says, let's just go with, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father, your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. How about that list? And the guy, hopes are getting up, he says, Jesus, we're good. I've got that. Like, I've, I've covered that list. Like, I'm not over there in the bloodshed and misery portion of life. I'm right here. I've done that. I've done these things. I mean, this was the kid who grew up in church. He went to Sunday school. He had the answers. He knew what was going on. But it's interesting to me. He asked Jesus. He says, I've done all of that. All these I've kept. What do I still lack? Now, the question I have about that is, how does he know he still lacks something? Because all Jesus told him to do was keep the commandments, and you got it. I think he knew he still lacked something because Romans 1 was at work in his life. Romans 3 was at work in his life. And the Spirit may have been at work in his life a little bit. To say, there's something still missing. What do I still lack? And Jesus looked at him and said, if you would be perfect, not good, if you want to be perfect, Go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And in that moment, Jesus touched that particular point in his life where he was going to wince the most. Jesus knew that this guy didn't have murder in his background. He knew that he didn't have all these problems in his background. Jesus knew what his problem was and he went to that point and he began to grind on it. It's like you got that knot in your shoulder and you put somebody sticks their thumb right into it and that, like everybody else, everywhere else is fine, but they hit that spot and you almost come off the table. That's what happened to this guy. Jesus hit that point, that moment, that particular sin where he knew his heart wasn't right. He knew he was condemned. You see, his problem was not an activity problem. His problem reveals that it was in the heart. Sin is the problem. But listen, good moral people are full of sin. And good moral people walk away from Jesus every single day. Because the one requirement for coming to Christ is knowing that you don't deserve it and you can't do anything to get to him. That's the one requirement for coming to him is knowing that you can't actually get to him but that he came to you. While moral people's actions may appear good in their heart, they've exchanged the creator for the created. And that exchange makes us guilty and invites the wrath of God as good as our life may look. And really the scariest part of all this is verse 20. 
and how we have convinced ourselves otherwise that we can get to God and that we can work our way into his good graces and that sin of the heart can be mitigated by actions of the hands. And the reality is, is that can't happen. Which leads us to the last piece of this morning. The only hope for our sin problem is Jesus. The only hope for your sinful heart is Jesus. Look with me in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets do bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Because, listen, there is no distinction. Make it clear. That's what he's saying here in verse 22. Make it clear. Everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whether you just have a selfish heart or whether you've got bloody hands, either way, you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But look at verse 24. But we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The only hope for our sin problem is Jesus. The unrighteousness of men, back from chapter 1, verse 18, the wrath of God was revealed against all the unrighteousness of men, has now given way to the revealing of the righteousness of God and how we get the righteousness of God. Because in verse 22, we get access to that righteousness. Look at how he says it in verse 22. For the righteousness of God has been revealed through faith in Christ Jesus. Do you see that phrase? Through faith in Christ Jesus. That's how we get access to the righteousness. By believing in the real, active trusting in Jesus Christ. And this is the only way for everyone. There is no distinction. The only way is through faith in Jesus, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, because God put him forward, verse 25, as a propitiation, as a atoning sacrifice by his blood to be received by faith. It was to show his righteousness, verse 26, at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith. In Jesus. The only hope for your sin problem is Christ. And believing and trusting and resting in what God has done through him for us. Would you pray with me this morning? I have no idea the condition of your heart as you walked into this place today. Only God knows that. Only God knows where you're at in relationship to him. I do know that we're all plagued by sin. question is is what have you done with that sin where is your sin the weight of your sin at is the weight of your sin resting still upon you are you still bearing the full effect and the wrath of God upon your life or are the scriptures true of your life The God made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin, that in him you might have the righteousness of God. Is your sin still upon you, or has it been passed? 
to Christ. This morning, that's the question that I would ask you to wrestle with. There is no doubt that we are all sinners. It's where does the weight of that sin fall? Is it falling upon you? Or have you allowed by faith in Christ for God to take your sin, to place it upon Christ, and to make you whole, and to make you new, to make you complete? Listen, if that's you this morning, if you have never let the weight of your sin fall upon Christ, I would love to talk with you and pray with you. I'd love to lead you to repentance and show you how to trust in Jesus. If you'd like to talk about that after the service, I'll be around down here at the front. We'd love to visit with you. It's not a complicated process. It's, it's repentance and faith and trust. But there are some of you in here this morning that are believers in Christ, but you look at your life and you say, man, I am still plagued by sin. I still fight it every single day, whether it be recurring or different sins, whatever, it doesn't matter. Let me just invite you again because the solution to your problem at salvation is the same solution to your problem today. We deal with sin now the same way we deal with it then, by letting it fall again upon Christ. by repentance and faith and trust that his salvation was good not just for them, but forever. So would you trust him today? Would you magnify the name of Christ today that he may be glorified in the midst of his people? It's in the name of Jesus we pray and ask God to let his spirit have his way. Amen.